answer, but I'll also be diligent enough to take the information and follow back up with you. Um, so at this time, I want to turn it to you to ask me any burning question or desires you might have. What's the total student population in Canada? Yeah, it's right around 67,000 students. Yes, sir. And the second, just to follow up, <clears throat> when I choose to send uh, a child to some place that's not in my immediate school vicinity, <coughs> Is it, is it my responsibility to provide transportation? Yes, sir. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Uh, you have three things, two of which, and it sounds like you're going to go find a job on um, kind of the micro level, but there are a couple things that you, you brought up that to, to me are, are still problematic from, from kind of a macro standpoint, especially in the relationship with the state of Florida. One is school security. There's a lot of discussion, and I know it's kind of personal, but you know, you know, getting you know, more police, you know, and hardening campuses. But everybody that I've talked to, there's a lot of consensus that you know that's just very limited, you know, in terms of what you can do on that end of the spectrum. And we still need to address, I think, really from a school safety standpoint, uh, you know, gun control of some some type, some fashion. Here, you know, it's very controversial. I mean, just seeing. You know the carnage that's taking place across this country is you know what what are we doing with the state on that level from sure. a school board perspective? And the other thing that was very troubling to me was the despair the despair the discrepancy and disparity between uh, that one slide you had with the with, with a with the highest you know per capita cost of the counties you know I mean as a percentage from nine thousand to seven thousand or six thousand that's a tremendously high percentage. In terms of the discrepancy in per pupil cost, I mean that's outrageous to me that this county, given the pressure on it in terms of growth, they're trying to do as much as they're doing, accommodating this population influx with that kind of a basis. I mean it, 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 it it's uh, you know it's not this slide. It's the, it's I was going to say there. Yeah, that's the one. Oh yes. Okay. And so you know, what's being done, those are the two macro issues with the state. Mm -hmm. And then um, the third, third comment I have is on a very micro selfish basis that I'm a member of the running club here. And we donate a lot of our proceeds from the marathon to the school district. We, can, we can't get access to the track, the high school track. I mean, that's just a little micro thing. But sure. it's like you talk about engaging the community. It'd be nice to be able to get out of the campus. We, we've helped out with a couple of cross-country meets. You know, and that's been kind of nice for us to get some you know, student contact. And I think if we were there, you know, physically on the track, it would be kind of a nice thing to interact with students and for them to see community members using the facility. Sure. And I'm glad to have a follow-up conversation with you on that. I don't know the history of what has or hasn't taken place up until this point. Um, there may be some very, um, legitimate reasons why it hasn't manifested the way you desire, but I'm glad to understand your side of it and then follow up to see where it's been and where it may go, yeah. for sure. Um, let me touch on the the other pieces. I'll start here and work backwards. Uh, school safety and security the macro level will be the latter part of what I touch on. Uh, I agree with you. Uh, this is a problem. And um, since, for instance, what's called the, the rollback on the RLE, the required local effort, the amount of money that school districts are allowed to charge, school boards are allowed to charge or levy. Uh, the legislature changed the rules on us a couple of years ago that said that we can only generate the same amount or charge the same amount that we did the year before. We did a calculation on that and just since that went in place, which I think was three years ago, don't quote me, but I believe three years ago, there's almost $42 million of operational costs that we've not been able to capture as a school district just as a result of that one approach and that was a Tallahassee approach. Let me share two. I'm not one, and you'll want to know this, this is just me being honest with you. I'm not one that stands here and casts the blame on our legislature and says that they're all evil and I'm pure and holy and everything they're doing is bad and everything I'm doing is good. I don't feel that way. Um, I think that across our legislature, um, I think we have some very well-intentioned good people and I think we have some people with some really bad ideas and really bad philosophies. Um, and we often agree and we often disagree on how it is we go about managing in their case, an $88 billion budget and how dollars are going to be allocated. The reason I preface with that is um, I always think it's a foolhardy approach for a local elected official or state in inverse 
to sit and solely point the finger at somebody else and say, well, if they only, if they only, if they only, while making sure that we're doing all of our parts. And, and this slide here, I think, is one of those examples that I would use of, we know that we're limited on what it is that we're ultimately going to receive from the state of Florida based on how the formula is constructed. So within those confines, we make sure that we operate as lean and as mean as we can so that we're doing everything that we can. Then, on the macro level, we go back to talk with, lobby, and have discussions with our legislature to say, this is what these policies end up creating for a district like Osceola. I mentioned earlier that I'm the current president-elect for the state of Florida, which will be the president. Um, I reluctantly, I guess, ran for that position. Uh, for years, I've been asked to run for that position, and I said no. I said, you know, my focus is Osceola County. I want to dedicate all of my time to making sure that I'm doing the best that I can for Osceola County. However, I recognize, and I've always been engaged at the legislative level, both in my professional life and in my elected life, um, but I realized that in order to do the things I needed to do at the local level, I needed to ele ele elevate the conversation at the state level. And so as a result of that, it's additional time and sacrifice away from my family and my businesses to do it, but I did it because I want to elevate some of those very key things which has to do with funding, the formula, school safety and security, and just some of the philosophical things that we deal with in the state of Florida continue to make sure we're putting in place the right policies to move us forward. That's a decent segue in the safety and security piece. Um, you're right, the uh, gun control is a very controversial issue and uh, many in the room may feel one way or the other on it and many in the room may feel differently than I would feel on it. Um, from a school board perspective, I don't have any authority on determining what does or doesn't happen with regard to the Second Amendment, of course. What my ultimate responsibility becomes is making sure that I'm doing everything I can to protect and secure our campuses and our students, and then making sure that I'm talking with my electeds at other levels to advance conversations that are actually going to result in real net <coughs> benefit and results, not just political sound bites and talking points, uh, which so often does happen in that space. To give you an example, um, one of the things I just spent uh, the last uh, three days last week working with the state school boards, and what that means so you know is uh, 67 school boards across the state of Florida are all part of one association, or there's one county that's not, but almost everybody is. Um, and then normally what will happen is each school board will elect somebody from their board to be the liaison or the representative on behalf. Our school board has been electing me to do that. Now that I've been elected to the officer position of president-elect, we've elected Clarence Thacker to sit in what used to be my seat on that as well. So we have two voices in Osceola County doing that now. As we all got together in North Florida last week to have some of those conversations, um, school safety and security, as you can imagine, was a, a big topic and will continue to be. This week, for the first time, Osceola County is actually hosting the legislative conference for the Florida School Boards Association right here in our backyard. Um, and that entire conversation on Thursday is going to be centered around what are the key priorities that is a school board association, so the collective voice of school boards, almost 3 million students in the state of Florida, what is the voice that we want to carry to Capitol Hill and Tallahassee and make sure that they hear a unified voice on what it is that we need to do for students, for schools, for communities, and of course for safety. Um, part of what will happen with that is making sure that we refine a, what can be a very broad and very convoluted legislative platform into some very laser focused approaches of what it is that we can do and move the needle on in this upcoming session. I will guarantee you, although I may get outvoted next week, but I highly doubt it, I will guarantee you that school safety and security will be of paramount importance, number one, because the law was just put in place last year along with some of the funding. However, there are a lot of unintended consequences and or a lot of unfunded components to it that school districts across the state of Florida are still trying to deal with, ourselves included. So the legislature, in my opinion, is going to go back to the table this session again and try to figure out what do they do to continue to work on implementing this language and how do they deal with the funding that's ultimately going to be tied to this language. There's also conversation, so you know, this still ties to the state piece, but this conversation on the state level that impacts local decisions because the question becomes who's really in charge. The sheriff is elected, but the sheriff's budget comes from the county commission. Ultimately, we're talking about school resource officers and safety and security in schools, which are then overseen by an elected school board, also duly elected constitutional officers. So whose real jurisdiction and responsibility does it fall within? Of course, we would submit it falls to all of us. We all have a shared responsibility to 
uh, protect our community, in our case, our community and our schools. But that is going to be part of the conversation as well because sheriffs across the state of Florida as well as police chiefs are saying, hey, this is a significant impact on our budget because we've had an increase in the number of school resource officers. Um, counties are looking at it and saying, yes, as a result of this, now we had to figure out how do we allocate resources that otherwise would have went to other transportation or public services now into the safety and security piece. And of course, school boards are getting hit significantly with it and saying, okay, well, we've got to continue to ramp up what we're doing. So it's a statewide policy that needs to be dealt with, but the implications and the mechanics of it are going to come into play here locally. Something that I would say you should be proud of is we have a group that works collectively in Osceola County called the Osceola Legislative Effort. Uh, that is the City of St. Cloud, City of Kissimmee, uh, Osceola School Board, and Osceola County Commission all work in partnership with one another. That when we go to Tallahassee to speak with our legislative delegation, we go with one voice on behalf of all of our residents in the community. That is actually something incredibly unique, um, more so than you may realize. Normally what happens is out of one county, you might have three, four, six, eight, or ten municipalities running in different directions, asking for different things from the same delegation members. Your school board may come up and then ask for something completely different and even contradictory. Your county commission may come up and ask for something completely different. And so that legislative delegation is trying to do the best they can to serve their constituency and to work with their other local elected officials, but everybody's all over the place and how do you do it? So a number of years ago, long before I was on the school board, this Osceola legislative effort was put together so we all meet collectively to say what are the things that we want to advocate for that are going to move the needle the most for Osceola County. And Neo City is one of those things just as an example and your county commission you can be proud of had been working for a number of years to make the message very clear that the way that the Osceola school district in particular is funded needs to increase. Just a few years ago we were able to bring home an additional four million dollars just for Osceola County as a result of a formula that I worked on a number of years ago called the High Growth Funding Formula, which is unique to a county like ours, that you have to have certain criteria and benchmarks that you have to meet in order to qualify. The law was still in the books, but the law was outdated and no longer applied, and myself and our lobby team, as well as our then CFO, uh, worked to uh, work with our legislature to get the language changed and then get allocations put in our budget, which brought ultimately another $4 million in one shot just to our community. So there's some really neat efforts that are taking place. I gave you a very broad answer, I know, but you asked some big and high-level questions. Um, I think the thing I would end with on that is there's an absolute commitment to continue to have those macro conversations. I'll be honest, I pride myself in my life on being a 30,000-foot thinker. I do not get the weeds. I'm not a micromanager. Um, I very much believe in empowering and delegating the people and giving them the space and the latitude and the rope they need to perform and excel. Um, and so I'll continue to operate that level as well. I know a number of other school board members. Thank you. Yes, sir. I have a small question. Is there a list online somewhere of the things that we're teaching at the technical college? Absolutely. Yeah, so if you go to osceolaschools.net and then you go, I believe it's under departments, um, you'll be able to find it. If not, when you're in there, there's a search feature, and you can just type in Osceola Technical College, and it will pull Because there are some key skills that aren't on the list that you showed us, and I don't know if these are the new things or if they're on top of a base of something. That's they're on top of a base, but yeah. it's a great observation. And that was also just the two ancillary yeah. campuses. The yeah. main campus wasn't highlighted on there, which has a whole other breadth of uh, offerings. Great question. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. What percentage of students in Osceola County are being homeschooled, and what role does the state department or the school board or anybody play in making sure that homeschooling fits the criteria that you need for a child to get a degree? Sure. I don't know the number of homeschooling. Do you have a rough idea, Mr. Phelps? It's around 1,500. 1,500 homeschooling. And then do you want to touch on, to your best of your knowledge, off the top, the oversight that we do from an administrative standpoint? Sure. Through our um, educational choices and charter office. Um, they are, parents are required to register a child on instruction. Really, the only oversight is that uh, on an annual basis, they are to submit some type of an assessment uh, to show where the students are as far as progressing. Beyond that, there really is not. Um, that's too much. Yeah. They have to do some type of an assessment. And typically, they will do a standard. They come into the school. Uh, first first school is the first school. Okay. Same standard. So, 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 the so, so the assessment is against a, a district-wide benchmark of some kind. Goals, set goals. Not necessarily. Uh, 
certified teacher can come in and provide an assessment and provide a certified letter that states that the child is okay. progressing on a grade level. Okay, so not all of them come in for a test. Not all. Okay. Yes, sir. Just real quick, um, you mentioned about the uh, new uh, New York City Academy, uh, and in that you mentioned the Osceola County School of the Arts. And just helping brag a little bit, uh, you realize there was a uh, national uh, outside source that actually ranked our Osceola School of the Arts as the number one high school in the state of Florida last year. So even while operating on a relative shoestring, uh, you still have some real success stories to talk about. And the other thing, and it's exciting, and it's total high school, uh, appears to be a uh, celebration high school football team got an unfortunate introduction to them last Friday night. Uh, so they're apparently off to a fast start, and not everybody's going to be happy about it. Duly noted, nothing I will do about that whatsoever. <laughs> and also, I'm, back, I'm sorry to lose you, but Tim's dad's in the hospital, and he left there to come here because they made a commitment. So, God bless you for that. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, the um, other thing I was going to touch on just briefly because you mentioned this slide, there's something that is referred to as the district cost differential. Um, we end up being adversely affected by that. It's part of that FDFP, that formula that I mentioned that funds schools across the state of Florida. We're not the only district that's affected by it. But the DCD ultimately makes adjustments to what school districts get based upon what the perceived cost of living is within that particular county. Um, and what happens as a result of that is many of our larger counties, including Orange County, many to the north, takes in a large amount of money that otherwise, in our opinion, belongs to Osceola County as a result of that, that compression and that differential that exists there. The idea in basic form is that it costs more, it's a, it's a cart of goods, if you will, but it costs more to buy a home in Orange County, in theory, than it does in Osceola County. And I say in theory, it does in reality. That's what I do is I'm in real estate companies. It does cost more. The median home price is a little bit higher. However, when you look at the difference between the median home price between Osceola and Orange, just as an example, I would also submit to you that our teachers are not the ones that are buying those homes. Um, they're not buying $300,000 homes in Orange County. Um, and so when you look at that and you compare then how that money is then taken through the DCD that ultimately impacts the school district budget, which I showed you that 76% of it goes to instruction and teachers and salaries and benefits, the formula in and of itself, in our opinion, is flawed. That's another one of those 30,000 foot level conversations that we've been having now for about 18 months, 24 months as a school board and working with other school districts across the state of Florida. I will submit to you though, humbly, that it is a very difficult thing to overcome. The districts that benefit the most from it happen to be the larger districts, which happen to have the largest legislative delegations as well. And so the idea of going to the Orange delegation or the Miami-Dade delegation or the Hillsborough or the Duval or any, and that's not to, they're all friends, so I'm not saying anything negative about anybody, uh, but the likelihood of those delegation members saying, yes, we agree that we want to take money from Duval and send it to Osceola County and adjust the DCD is not very likely. And just a quick, uh, I mean, that's a 35% variance between, you know, the high and low. Yeah. You know, it's just like, so I'm glad, I'm glad there's some focus on that issue because obviously it's a critical one. Yeah. Especially when you're, you know, you're sandwiched up in the Orange County. And, you know, really it's almost a contiguous geography. Yep, in so many ways. And of course, as you can imagine, a lot of this is derived from property values, just so you know. I mean, that's where a lot of this uh, is, is ultimately generated from. When you look at the coastal areas of this great peninsula, they have beachfront property that is assessed at a much higher value, and as a result, they're able to generate a higher ad valorem tax base than we are as an inland county. And a county that historically has been viewed as a bedroom community to the metro areas to our north, um, although we're working hard to change that. Remember I said education is a precursor to economic development. So everything that we're doing and everything that we're talking about is about the idea of how do we make sure we have the best education system in Osceola County so that we can start bringing those jobs here as opposed to seeing going to other areas around us. As we do that, that will help increase our overall uh, property values, our tax rolls, and the revenue that we can then generate to provide even better education. I think with that, I'll conclude and thank you guys again for the honor to be back here. Thank you.
Unfortunately, that's the end uh, tonight. The uh, representative from Advent.